Hey, Kristen, sorry about that. Just a minute and the last class, so it just stayed on. Uh, he said he finished at like 11. Yeah, but it was still on. Oh, got it. Hey, Ms. Goshen, are you having anything on the Justin? Yeah, 10%. 10? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. Hi. Sorry about the delay. Delaying me writing a big fat check, though, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to wait, see if we get a few more people on the call here. I think we might be missing a few because of the inability to log in. How are you guys doing? Nice to see your faces. Doing good, thank you. You're welcome. Nice to see your face too, beautiful. Oh, thank you. I'm so tired. I do not feel beautiful. You do not look it. You look great. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, uh, if you want to spur your real estate business, plan a vacation, and then all of a sudden you'll get very busy. Oh, okay, that's a good yeah. idea. <laughs> I, I might take it. Um, I had a quick question. Is your phone number still the same from like the last time a while oh, ago? Yeah. Have you changed it? I'm never changing my number. I'm an agent. <laughs> okay, just making sure because I think I tried texting you and it's something back to back. Okay, I'll be. It's 310. Hold on. Let me just. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. One three one zero. Uh huh. Four zero two. Nine nine one zero. Perfect. I have it. I don't know why I did that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and start. Kristen, I really like your jacket. Oh, thank you. Not over here. Where is it from? Burberry. I love it. It's thank gorgeous. You. I was thinking the same thing. And give gorgeous. me um, Devil Wears Prada vibes. Not that yeah. you're that, but that movie. <laughs> oh, I can be, man. <laughs> not about if I like you or not. Um, all right. So today we're going to talk about disclosures, uh, not TDS and SPQ because we did that last week and they're a whole class in and of themselves. Uh, let me go ahead and screen share the package with you. Can everyone see? All right. So this disclosure information advisory is um basically just telling sellers that they have to fill out certain disclosures and uh you know that they need to carefully review all the questions and disclose any information whether or not it's part of the questions and the disclosures if they think it's important um and to understand or excuse me to answer to the best of their ability if they cannot remember or they don't know they need to indicate so um, and that's perfectly fine also, if there's any uh, documentation available, they need to make it available to the buyer and supply those reports, estimates, whatever documentation in uh, relation to anything they're disclosing to um, their buyers, if it's in their possession. Um, it takes time to complete disclosures. And um, generally speaking, um, guideline is if they're uncertain about whether or not something is important enough to be, to disclose, they should probably disclose it, All right? So instructions are don't leave any questions blank or unanswered unless the section's not applicable. Um, questions ask if you're aware. Again, if you don't know the answer, then you are not aware and you should answer the question no. Um, provide details if you can who, what, when, where, and how. Um, disclosure forms use broad language. Uh, that doesn't mean a seller should limit information, documents, and explanations that they provide to buyers. Like I said, if there's something that should be disclosed that is not addressed on the do uh, documentation, it should be disclosed anyhow. 
Okay. Um, we're not going to talk about this because this is about completing the TDS and SPQ, the two most important uh, dis seller disclosures. Right. So um, this disclosure information advisory is very helpful, particularly for a new agent, because when you do disclosures with your seller, I like to do them over the phone or in person. Um, if you read this, you can basically, you know, tell them everything they need to know ahead of time and sort of guide them through this form, which sets the stage for a much more successful and streamlined completion of the package. Okay. So like I said, this is a full set of disclosures. We went over this transfer disclosure statement last week. We won't be doing that today. Same thing with seller property questionnaire. All right, so residential earthquake risk disclosure statement. Um, this is a bunch of questions, mostly about foundation stuff, but there's some other questions on here, like is the water heater braced to resist falling during an earthquake? So again, your instructions to the seller are, you know, if you don't know, you say don't know. If it doesn't apply, you know it doesn't apply, say doesn't apply. You only use yes and no if they know for a fact if something's done. So um, one of the most common things that comes up during completion of disclosures is, well, they're reading, let's say, for instance, the second question, is your home bolted to its foundation? And your client's like, well, what is that? Guys, what kind of uh, guidance would you give them as far as answering if they're asking, what is that? Come on, don't know. They don't can know. say they don't know. Yeah. If they don't know what something means, how can they know the answer? Right? Okay. So um, you'll see these last two questions here. They say to be reported on natural hazard disclosure statement. The natural hazard disclosure statement is a report that the seller is required to give to the buyer. Typically, escrow orders this once we open escrow, so we don't have to worry about this. It's part of the contract negotiation. Parking and storage disclosure. So this disclosure really only applies if uh, the property is a condominium or planned unit development. And it's just gonna identify what parking spaces and whatever storage spaces belong with the unit if there are, if there is assigned parking and storage. Okay, so again, this document, this disclosure is not required unless the property is a condominium or planned unit development that doesn't have, you know, like attached garage parking. All right, statewide buyer and seller advisory. As an agent, you 100% should read all of this. It talks a lot about, you know, the duties um, that all of the parties have in the transaction, but also, um, you know, buyer's right to access, um, seller making the property available for inspection, things like that. Um, and I don't particularly like this document. It's 14 pages of information to read. And it goes over everything that can possibly be uh, investigated. And while I don't like it, this document is very necessary, right? It's telling the buyer, Hmm, what are the types of things you might want to have uh, inspected during your inspection period? So it's all of these things, easements, access and encroachments, environmental hazards, formaldehyde. I mean, you know, we typically don't have these types of inspections like formaldehyde and mold unless our general inspector advises us during that inspection that they think that we should have something further inspected by a specialized inspector. Now, that being said, if your buyer asks for any of these inspections, uh, you really should not do anything to try to talk them out of it. If they want a mold inspection from the get-go, we get them a mold inspection. Um, I am not certain that this is the right way to do things, but I will tell you myself personally, when I've had buyers that, you know, want to set up 12 inspections, I do say to them, hey, this 
would be considered and perceived as a little excessive. Um, and it's going to give the seller cause for concern because we typically do, you know, some of these more specialized inspections after our general inspector indicates that he thinks we should. He or she, inspectors can be women, I have only met one, but they can be women. Um, now, at the same time, you know, if you want them, I'll 100% set them up. I just want you to know how that might be perceived. I don't know like how much I'm open, opening myself up to liability in that instance, but I'm trying to manage expectations on all sides. So um, I'll briefly discuss with you. I have a whole class on inspections and negotiation, but uh, what I would consider core inspections would be general, termite, sewer. If there's a pool or spa, a pool or spa. If there's a fireplace, a chimney inspection. If it's a hillside, soil or geological, we just call it geological inspection. Everything else would generally be secondary in my book. Um, unless there's maybe something special on the property, a septic system, something like that, I would then uh, consider that primary. All right, so, you know, like I said, this table of contents goes over anything and everything that a buyer might inspect. And so if you have quite the reader, they might be reading and be like, oh, I wanna have building permits pulled. Well, we have service providers that can do that. Um, you know, what about heating, ventila ventilation and air conditioning systems? Again, I would give that same advice. Well, hey, uh, we can definitely have that inspected typically we would do so if the general inspector indicated that he thought there needed to be uh, further inspection. But if you'd like them, I can set them. Um, another way I present it is also, you know, if we do all these inspections, you're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. So you may want to wait and see what the general inspector says, because if he says everything looks good and you feel confident about what he's telling you, maybe you don't want them. Um, or maybe the inspection comes back so bad that you don't want to spend any more money inspecting at all on this property. You want to just cancel the escrow. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of this, but you definitely should. Um, I, when I renewed my last, my license last time, some of the education I had to do, I had an elective, I think I chose environmental hazards. So, um, some of these inspections like formaldehyde, um, while I tell you, if your buyer wants these inspections, you need to do them. Formaldehyde is, uh, it's an inspection where, I mean, like the seller has to leave the house for the day, doors and stuff shouldn't be opened. Um, so, you know, don't just think any inspection is like, you know, your typical standard inspections where you set them up and you're okay. There, there might be special requirements that the sellers have to adhere to in order to perform the inspection. So this is 14 pages of basically scaring your buyer <laughs> um, and not everything applies, but it's always a good thing to read through and know, particularly as an agent, because if you're selling a property with an ADU, well, you want to make sure that it's actually an ADU, not a guest house. You want to see how it's permitted so that um, your buyer knows what the legally allowed uses are, right? So like a guest house, uh, can you rent it out versus an ADU? I think there are some laws that say like with an ADU, you can rent out the ADU if you occupy the primary uh, structure as your primary residence, but uh, you cannot rent them out separately if you do not. But I think it's different um, instance to instance even. So, you know, those are some of the things to think about and investigate so that you can properly advise your, uh, your buyers. Um, and when in doubt, you know, if you're not expected to know everything, you're not a specialist at a very minimum though, um, one of the things you can do as you're growing your business as a new agent is you can look up, uh, you know, access points to where can we look up this information if we want. So you have this ready and available, um, when the time comes, if, uh, if you end, end up under contract and your buyer needs some additional information. So. Oh, who do I contact? And one of the nice things about this 
document, the only thing I really do like about it is that it does have a lot of links to different things. Um, let me see here. Yeah. I mean, in this instance, it has a link here. Um, it generally does give some kind of idea of where you can get information. Um, let's see. So there's information about heating and ventilation. You know, these are links that you can just click on. You can copy and paste into browsers and read about. And so this is a very powerful tool as far as educating your buyer without uh, interpreting the information for them. And the reason it's important not to interpret the information for them is if you interpret it wrong, then you are at, you know, you're opening yourself up to liability. Okay. I'm going to continue on to the next document here. So guys, you see like this is 14 pages. I generally set an appointment to do disclosures with my seller or my buyer if I'm receiving them when I'm under, under contract. Um, I generally send the disclosures over the day before. Why I wanna give them ample opportunity to read through this because I don't wanna read through this line by line with them. That would take me five hours, right? So if I send this over to them and I set a time you know, the following day or the day after that to review anything, you know, I can give them the instruction, hey, if you have any questions, please note them and then we can discuss them. Um, I do still go over things that I find important, um, particularly on the buyer side, right? I've reviewed them and I want to make my buyer aware of anything that, uh, you know, is abnormal or maybe troublesome that the seller has disclosed. Okay, market conditions advisory. So this is generally included with the RPA package. So if you are on the buyer side, you guys are gonna sign this at the time you make an offer. On the listing side, you're gonna receive it after you enter contract. Okay, and so it basically just tells um, clients that markets change. Uh, it's impossible to predict future conditions of the market. Um, talks about the feature of a seller's market. So in a hot real estate market, which is seller's market, generally more buyers than sellers, um, that that leads to multiple offers basically. Um, and so uh, it's, you know, um, basically warning buyers that uh, they might be offering more than they originally planned or um, giving up, giving contingency terms that they're not as comfortable with. Um, and so in a less competitive or cool market, there are generally more sellers than buyers. It's called the buyer's market. And it causes real estate prices to either level off or drop. Um, and let's see, it talks about foreclosures, which we wouldn't be involved in um, as agents. Uh, we're not allowed to represent foreclosure buyers. Um, and that foreclosures and short sales can dramatically affect the value of property around it, but we can't control that, right? Um, and so it, it does have downward effect on uh, property value. All right, so buyer considerations says as a buyer, you're responsible for determining the price you want to offer for a property. Um, non-contingent offers that it's basically against the advice of an agent. Um, you know, if a property doesn't appraise, you might not get a loan. Um, and, you know, that it's very risky. Loan contingency, if you give up your loan contingency and can't get a loan, um, and because of that, you can't purchase the property, you're gonna be legally liable for default of the, the terms of the contract. And so you might lose your deposit. Same thing with an appraisal. So if you lift your appraisal contingency, your lender's still gonna require an appraisal. But if you don't have an appraisal contingency, you don't have the right to cancel a contract. Uh, 
under that contingency or for the fact that it didn't appraise. But if it doesn't appraise, you can't get your loan unless you come in with extra cash as the buyer. Um, inspection contingency. Obviously, we all know what that is, but um, if you make an offer without that or you remove the contingency, um, you know, uh, you might not get all the information you need or you might find out information that makes you want to cancel the transaction. And so, you know, it's very risky. Give me a second, guys, sorry. Seller consideration, seller is responsible for determining their listing price and their accepted price. Okay, water conserving plumbing fixtures and carbon monoxide detector notice. So under California state law, all single family residences built on or before January 1st, 1994 have to have water conserving plumbing fixtures. Okay, multifamily and commercial properties, same thing. Exceptions doesn't apply to historical property or real property where plumbing or installation of water conserving plumbing fixtures is not possible really. Okay, so um, how do we take care of that guys? How do we know what is water conserving? We don't, right? Who do we hire? Plumber. No? no. Well, maybe, yeah, plumber, special type of plumber. What type of plumber? We're going to hire a retrofitting contractor, a retrofitting company. So that's actually required in the city of Los Angeles, the city of Beverly Hills, several other cities, but you can still hire a retrofitting company to come out and make sure that California regulations for requirements are adhered to, okay? So in the city of Los Angeles, we actually have a certificate of compliance that um, is required on all sales. And that checks several things, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide, water heater strapping, low flow water devices, um, earth, gas earthquake shutoff valves, that sort of thing. Um, so that, has to happen in the city of Los Angeles. Now we don't need that certificate for sale or in order to make the sale in a lot of other cities, but I would still recommend telling the seller they should just go ahead and hire a retrofitter. And I might even recommend that they might want to do that prior to going on the market, unless I think the terms of, of the listing are tough ones. I don't want them to incur costs if I don't think I can sell their property. Um, but uh, yeah, when in doubt, just hire a retrofitting company, whether or not it's required. Okay, carbon monoxide detectors. Okay, California law requires that um, as of 2011, basically all dwellings have to have carbon monoxide detectors installed. Um, doesn't matter really what type of dwelling it is. Um, the exception is a, a dwelling unit that doesn't have fossil fuel burning heater or appliance, a fireplace or an attached garage. Okay. So if there's no stove, no water heater, um, you know, if there is nothing that could possibly cause a fire, uh, cause carbon monoxide issues, I guess, uh, I guess it's not required, but Good luck selling a house or selling your buyer on a home that doesn't have a way to cook or stay warm. Disclosure of carbon monoxide detectors. Um, in a dwelling, however, just, ah, so it says that we don't have a special um, disclosure for carbon monoxide detectors, but it is a question on the TDS. Okay, mm -hmm. this talks about the terms of how 
uh, carbon monoxide detector has to be installed, right? You can't just throw them in the house. They have to be uh, done in a certain way, generally outside of each sleeping area, uh, definitely one on each floor. Um, so, you know, again, these are not things that we need to know. And I would just highly recommend having a retrofitter come out. So look, buyer is advised to consult with a professional buyers choosing to determine whether the property has carbon monoxide detectors installed as required by law. Um, generally speaking, appraisers check for these things as well. And they may, may actually require that they're installed if they're not before they will finalize the appraisal. Local requirements. We just talked about that. Um, that certif certificate of compliance we have for LA, some you know local uh, cities maintain their own uh, retrofit or point of sale requirements, um, which could include water conserving fixtures and carbon monoxide, which city of LA does. Um, so every city's different. If you're uncertain as to what the city requires for the property that you're working with, um, I would highly recommend calling up a KW, KW office and talking to the escrow officer. A KW office in the area that you're uh, representing a seller or a buyer and talking to the escrow officer and asking about any of the local requirements. Okay, water heater and smoke detector statement of compliance. Again, water heater has to be strapped, smoke detectors have to be installed. Um, we have state law. But we also have some cities, again, more restrictive local requirements. Um, um, Kristen, who generally pays for the retrofit, uh, retrofitter to come out? Generally the seller. The seller? Yeah, industry standard is the seller. Obviously everything's negotiable in real estate, but we have no idea what's going to be needed and no idea what it's going to cost. So I, I really don't like, uh, no matter who I'm representing. As a listing agent, I don't like uh, asking the buyer to pay for it. I'm honestly, like we don't really want the buyer altering the property in any way, right? They haven't bought it yet. Who knows if the company that they hired is any good. Um, and then as the buyer's agent, well, why would I wanna bind my buyers to paying, you know, a fee we don't know what it will be and um, doing I mean, generally work. for them to come out, how much does it cost and which company do you recommend? Uh, it generally costs between $100 and $150 for them to come out, not do the work, come out and check everything. Um, I really like Metro retrofitting, but they take forever. So I have some new guy that I just started using and I really like him and he's fast. Let me see. Vince Curtis with Retrofit LA. You guys ready for the number? Yes, no? 310-800-4418. I'm sorry, what was his name? Vince Curtis. Vince Curtis, thank you. You're welcome. That reminds me, I did not get my loan contingency removal. Okay. Um, all right, so same thing with smoke detector, water heater. It has to be done. And everyone's being made aware of what the state law is and that there could be more restrictive requirements that are imposed by the city. All right, lead-based paint. So guys, if your property was built in 1980, do you need this, this disclosure? No. No, that's right. This disclosure is only required for homes that were built prior to 1978. Can anyone tell me why? 
they, they use lead. Yeah, because they stopped using <laughs> paint with lead in it. Okay, so here the seller would only disclose. Um, it, it already says that they don't have knowledge of lead-based paint. So the only thing they would be filling in is if they have knowledge of lead-based paint, okay? Um, and then if they have reports regarding it, they would enter something here, okay? If we want to watch this uh, again oh. later on, because it kept not letting me come in, it said host is in another meeting. Is there a way that we could go it back? did the same for all of us. Uh, yeah, Alfredo usually um, posts these re uh, to my YouTube channel. I actually think I have a better one. Um, the disclosure package I was given today, I don't think is complete. Like the, the disclosure class I have previously has our brokerage specific disclosures in it. I think it's a little bit better and a little bit longer. And in all honesty, I'm just super tired. Okay, no, <laughs> just because the first 20 minutes I wasn't able to log in and just said host is- Oh, none another. of us were, none of us were. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. None of us were. I thought I might be off the, off the hook for teaching class, but no, not so much. <laughs> um, all right. Next is square footage and lot size disclosure and advisory. So it basically says that, and this is really common guys, when builders provide square footage, they might be providing square footage. That's not legal livable square footage. And they disclose it that way on the MLS, but then over time, you know, the MLS is a certain square footage. So the next agent who lists it, he just, uh, you know, he or she just uses that information. Um, property records may or may not have it correct. One of the uh, biggest discrepancies you're ever going to find in real estate is the square footage. And, you know, no surprise, one of the biggest sources of lawsuits in real estate is over square footage. So, um, you know, there is an appraiser supposed to, you know, uh, take a property out for square footage. A lot of them don't, they get lazy. Um, so if a buyer really wants to know exactly what the square footage is, they should hire, uh, you know, someone to come out and tape it, an appraiser or a floor plan drawing company, okay? Um, same thing, well, not same thing, but uh, properties, lot size, dimensions, configurations, and boundaries. Um, Lauren, do you guys do this on occasion? Do you guys um, come out and do the lot line? No? I know that Lauren did, I think, like one time in the very beginning of his career, but I think we just send people out now. Oh, no, that's what I mean. You have like people that you work with to send out that can identify a lot line or, or flag stuff off. Yeah, 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 of course. We could send people, we know people. Yeah, so um, generally speaking, uh, your your title professional is generally the source um, to you know find someone who can identify a property lot line for you. But your client can also just get a, an official survey. It costs a lot of money. Um, so, you know, title doesn't come out and do the same job or the title reps don't hire someone to come out and do quite the same job that a surveyor would. But, you know, if they need something measured out and marked so you know where a lot ends or something like that, they can help you with that. Um, generally, uh, sometimes like uh, they add, like, let's say the house has a deck or a, an ADU or a garage or whatever. Do they generally, as a matter of law, is that generally added as when they advertise something on the MLS, let's say at 3,000 square feet, let's say the house itself is only 2,800, but 200 feet is an ADU or garage or deck or whatever. No, let's what talk about that. Let's talk about what square footage is supposed to be, supposed to be advertised as a square footage. That's livable square footage. So is a deck livable square footage? No. Is a garage livable square footage? No. ADU is livable square footage. Does that mean it's done correctly? It does not, but you know, as far as the requirements go of what is supposed to be included in square footage, livable square footage, livable permitted square footage is what's allowed to be advertised. Thank You'll you. see like, then, you're welcome. And then Thank along you. the same lines, if a house, uh, let's say on the MLS is advertised that the year built is 1968, 
But we just got the 9A reports that says 1948. I mean, that discrepancy, that like extra 20 years of the age of the house, who deals with that and how? I mean, where did you get the original date from? On the MLS, the house was advertised. Okay, but the as MLS is only as good as the information and that's kind of the conversation we're having as the people who originally entered it, right? So unfortunately, when we go to public record section of our MLS, you'll see it sometimes sourced. Um, it will say, you know, the square footage will oftentimes just be uh, changed to whatever the last listing agent that sold it, put it in us, right? right? So if I changed square footage on something that was 1500, you know, I sold it. Um, and for whatever reason, I had no idea I didn't do it the right way. I add it, you know, I put something in at 1900. Well, the next agent who's looking at public records, they very well may see 1900, not the 1600 that was there previously. So, um, you know, don't go, don't take the information that is coming from the MLS or property records through our MLS as accurate information. You would talk to someone like Alyssa or Lauren if you want an actual factual year built, because that's the, um, you know, a certificate of occupancy is issued for, for the property. Um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Christine, is that why the enlisting agent, most often they say that the seller is not responsible for the exact square footage? Yes. That's that what is why you'll work. see in private remarks that blanket language all the time that uh, agent and seller is not responsible for uh, uh, verification of the exact square footage and that buyer should you know, investigate to satisfy them. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, this, sorry, this disclosure package isn't right. That was created for me. Um, this trust advisory, a trust advisory is only required as a disclosure if the buyer or seller is in a trust. Actually, if the seller's in a trust, not even if the buyer's in a trust. Trust advisory is only, uh, required if your seller is a trust. So this is an optional disclosure. Again, this is an op, well, not optional. Uh, this disclosure representative capacity signature disclosure is only required for those that, those sellers that our entity is not natural people. So trust, corporation, LLC, um, anything that's not a natural name. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. This, this package is not complete at all. Um, I did. I only gave our office a short while to compile it, so um, some of that's on me. Anybody have any general and uh, questions about disclosures? I'm open to just fielding questions since I don't think I have. A complete package. I have a question about the ADU. Did you say that if we have a home? and you added ADU to it, you cannot rent ADU separately if you don't occupy it. So you have, you can't have two tenants in there. Is that right? So you'd have to check with each city, but I just, I'm having major oh. problems with the lease I did because uh, I rented the main house, but the owner has tenants in the ADU. And at least for her property in the city of West Hollywood, um, we found out after we leased the main house that it is not okay for the homeowner to rent out the ADU if they are not occupying the primary structure, the primary house. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that that holds true for every property or every city. I don't know. You'd have to check with the city on that. That, I feel like that's huge because I've come across a lot of, um, properties that have a lot of ADUs and then they're like there's a lot of tenants living in the main and in the ADU all over LA County yeah so I, get yeah I think it's I, I don't know if it's every instance um I certainly if I lease out a property or sell a property that has tenants in 
um, in place in either of the structures, I'll certainly check, right? But um, I don't know the answer to that. I just know it can be a problem. So you'll definitely want to check with the city. Yeah, now I, that, I, that you brought this to our attention, that I didn't know that this was a thing. So now that I know, I'm glad that you're sharing this with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason for that is because an ADU is just a, like, you know, it's an accessory dwelling unit. It's not its own, it's not multifamily, right? Make sense? Correct. Yes. Uh, my question is from the time that the seller provides the disclosures, generally, what is the number of days that the um, prospective buyer has um, as far as lifting their contingencies? And also, what if the seller is late in delivering their uh, disclosures? Then what does that legally speaking for a buyer, what can they do? Okay, so um, the first question, how long does the seller have to give those disclosures to the buyer? Well, under section 14B of our RPA, okay. um, the boilerplate language is that seller has seven days to provide these to the buyer. However, if you as the buyer's agent, when you wrote the offer, modified it or someone countered the term, then it's going to be whatever negotiated time frame. Um, so generally seven days. And so if they give it to you on the seventh day, that's it. You have one day. Not this, it's not quite fair, but that's the way it goes. Now, if they give it to you on the eighth day, um, any report, disclosure, or documentation that's provided to you after the time frame in which it should, or after that contingency is that correlated contingency is removed, the buyer has five days, five days to review that documentation, and the seller can't do anything about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I what think it's the name. I'm sorry. What was the name of the form that you said when the buyers ask for additional days to continue their investigations? Let's say during their investigation. Extension of find... time. Extension of time addendum. Extension of time addendum. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any time frame that you want to modify in the entire transaction is going to be uh, addressed on that document. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, guys, that an agent visual inspection disclosure and AVID is technically part of the seller disclosure contingency. So no matter who you're representing as the agent or, you know, in the transaction, just make sure you get your AVID done ASAP. Um, you, you certainly don't want to be the technicality that uh, allows someone to, you know, wiggle out of a deal um, or change terms or renegotiate anything. Um, if that's going to happen, you want it to be between the clients, not because of some action you took or failed to take. That includes building report also, guys. So the cities that require building reports, technically that's a seller disclosure. And we all know those can take seven days, 14 days. It comes from the city. The city doesn't care, right? So if we have a seven day seller disclosure contingency, but we don't get the building report until the 10th day. Technically, the buyer has five additional days to review that document. You know, technically the seller can enforce the buyer lifting the seller disclosure contingency. So if you don't have a building report, well, that's the seller disclosure. Um, uh, HOA docs as well. That's part of the investigation contingency not part of the disclosure contingency, part of the investigation contingency. The building report is the 9A, correct? For City of Los Angeles, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Christine, if you buy a house which is tear down, like when I mean, the house is standing on the land, but it's a tear down, mm -hmm. do you have to get any disclosure from the seller as far as hazard? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. I mean, uh, probably up until about 10 years ago, we used to be able to get some of them waived, but uh, with a buyer's declaration that they intended to demolish the structure, but not anymore. Uh, another question I have. Uh, John? I think you muted yourself, <laughs> so I can't hear you. Sorry, Kristen. This form that you mentioned about is in this disclosure. A lot of them are in the Keller William addendum. So we like a retrofitting and the lead base. 
So you don't yeah, have to do that. Williams, those the Keller Williams addendum, it just goes over a lot of the stuff. It, it's not in place of the actual disclosure. It's simply like an advisory sheet, kind of summarizing all the things that might affect the property. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this one is better. We will do this one. This is sufficient. You're going to do both, John. The brokerage oh. is going to require that we do all the brokerage specific disclosures as oh. well as uh, the, you know, the CAR disclosures. Oh, okay, okay. And your cooperating agent is going to also have some documents that maybe their brokerage requires that ours doesn't. And they're also going to have their own brokerage specific disclosures. So no matter what, almost every time you do a deal, unless you're doing deals with the same brokerage continuously, um, there's going to be a slightly different packet of disclosures that are required. Hmm. Anybody else? Uh, so I missed the first part. This, so this disclosure is in addition to TDS and SPQ. Yes. So there should be three disclosures basically, right? <laughs> Way more than three, John. Way more than three. We, I mean, three forms of that's, that's TDS. PSQ and, SPQ, and this is not one document. This is several documents. And I can tell you right now, the, the office compiled this uh, set of documents for me today, and it is not complete. There are more than this, and there are brokerage specific uh, disclosures. In mm -hmm. addition to that, if you go to my YouTube channel, there is a much more inclusive disclosure uh, class. And I actually think I put a link to like a, a, a full packet of disclosures, including at least at the time, what our brokerage uh disclosures had as well thank you mm -hmm. where can we get a full set of disclosures guys where can we always get broker specific stuff if we need it who is your go-to if you don't know if you need something michael rosales or no 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 <laughs> brian brian Chung, guys. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Brian who? Brian Chung, the TC in our office. Brian Chung, okay. Yeah, so as mentees, you're not allowed to use them on your first deal. You can use them on your second deal. That's because I need you to know how to do the documents, DocuSign, upload to command, all of that. But he is still there to give you checklists. To uh, You can pick his brain about what documents you need. Um, and he has the most up-to-date brokerage specific disclosures that our office requires always he's the one who makes that checklist for us at the direction of michael rosales um and he is much more available than someone like michael rosales or myself would be so if you have a simple question about a document do i need this he's going to be a lot faster getting back to you than michael or myself I just want to say you're amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are truly, truly amazing. Thank you, thank you. Um, I second that. No, oh, thank you. You guys are making me blush. <laughs> All right, anyone else need any help? No, okay. Well then, thank you. I will not see you guys next week because I will be in the Caribbean on a beach. Oh. oh my Not God! Oh my God. Missing you. you just came back from Las Vegas. Take me on the luggage. <laughs> Take you on the luggage. Yeah, well, I might have trouble carrying my luggage then. I'll be more than happy to help you carry your luggage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can help too. <laughs> Where are you going in the Caribbean? Where are you going? Um, I'm going to Cancun and then. Uh, uh, a little okay. island off of Cancun, I forget. Um, Isla Mujeres? Uh, no. Uh, like Tulum. Tapa. Oh, you're going sorry, I am going to Isla Mujeres one day, just a day trip. And then I'm going to Tulum also. Oh my God. You're going to, have you been to either? Yes. Okay. Um, I haven't been to Tulum or Isla Mujeres in probably 10 years, but I've been to Cancun almost every year. Uh, okay. I hope you go to the diving. I hope you go to note the diving and I have a lot of fun you're gonna enjoy it thank you thank enjoy you. every moment you deserve it oh thank you yeah if i don't have a vacation i'm gonna like stop showing up to these things so <laughs> what's that I have a large hibiscus margarita for all oh, of i will have many different types of margaritas <laughs> for all of you many times over what are you staying at um 
called Crystal, uh, Crystal Cancun Resort. I stayed there two other times. I really like where it's located. It's like at the end of the hotel zone so that it's not next to all the little party kids. Nice. I've got some good restaurants nearby. Yeah, and you. it's beachfront. I have a little tide pool where there are little fishies every morning. Oh, I can't wait to see them. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And I'm going with a professional photographer. So I should have really good vacation. Ooh. Ooh, I oh, I can't. Yeah. 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 Pablo Escobar has a they have they opened the one ruined house and to and they turned it into a hotel so I hope you get to go see them that'd be awesome sounds cool Lauren I wanted to tell you a friend of mine just closed yesterday on an 18 million dollar deal she's a good friend of mine on Carolwood it was a trust sale it just closed yesterday they were asking 23 they sold it for 18.3 or something like that so she's very excited. Yeah, good for her. I'm not surprised. Lots of money out there and, and people will spend it. Yes, yes. The Beverly Hills market is picking up and picking up like with a force. Good. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. Thank Nice you. Enjoy. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Be safe, Christine. Thank you. I will be as safe as my dr drinks allow. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs>